Um, so I'm so excited to introduce Sage. I've actually had the honor and pleasure of knowing him for many, many, many years. Um, we are in a very um, similar health vortex um, community and I highly recommend you guys checking Sage out after tonight. Even though we're friends, I secretly stalk him on Instagram because he's constantly <laughs> giving the most empowering, epic, you know, tips and tricks on like how to truly live this um, healthy lifestyle. Um, he is the co-founder of Addictive Wellness, um, the chocolate that we sell here at Paws. It's literally one of the only chocolates I put into my body because it is sugar-free and filled with adaptogenic herbs and um, tonics, I mean herbs and um, yeah, herbs. tonic yeah, herbs, yeah. thank you. Um, and that's really Sage's specialty. So not only is he the founder of this, but he really specializes in nutrition and herbology, and he gives you this amazing alternative um, look into the wellness space. So I'm so excited to introduce him, and he's going to give us um, all the life hacks to have us sleeping wonderfully so we can be better humans on the planet. Awesome. So, pass it away. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you to everybody for, for being here, and thank you, Tamara, everyone at Pause for having me. I'm super excited to talk with you guys about sleep. Um, to give you a little quick background on me, I had the good fortune to kind of grow up in and around the health world. Um, my parents had a meditation center when I was a kid. They had a, you know, opened a wellness center when I was a teenager, so I grew up you know, going and taking infrared saunas as a teenager, and now, you know, my parents are work with clear light saunas, the infrared saunas they have here, so I've kind of just grown up in and around this, and from my mid-teens, I just got super excited and inspired about it, thinking, like, you know, I've seen all these people coming into their wellness center who were, you know, maybe in their 50s, 60s, and dealing with this back problem, or this problem, or that problem, you know, and I just got to think, you know, okay, they're all working at fixing these problems once they've already happened. What if I just got into all this stuff now, when I'm like fresh and have nothing wrong, and what could that mean in terms of my potential, what I can do with my life, how good I'll feel every day, and long term, like longevity, and what can I, you know, achieve in life extension? Um, and so, the more I started doing and trying in different superfoods and, and herbs and dietary practices, the better I would feel. The better I would feel, the, the more stuff I would do. The more stuff I would do, the better I'd feel, the more I'd want to learn and discover new things. And eventually I got into traditional herbal systems of indigenous cultures and, and deep into nutrition and all kinds of things. And it was just this beneficial cycle that just kept snowballing, snowballing, and snowballing. Um, eventually leading to uh, doing consulting with hotels around the world to incorporate elixir bars into their, into their cafes and restaurants. And then to starting addictive wellness, um, doing sugar-free raw chocolates with all these different herbs and elixirs and um, also bringing these uh, individual herbal extracts because you know people were asking us like where do I find this where do I find that and we wanted to be able to give them the best that we were already using um, so that's my background but you didn't come here to hear about me you came here to hear about sleep um, <laughs> sleep is such an important component of health it is really the most performance enhancing thing you can do period is getting quality sleep and before we jump too far deep into it, I want to go a little bit into some a couple of technical terms that are going to be important to understand. Um, and if you, there's basically just two terms, and if you can remember these, it'll make everything else a lot easier to understand as we go through uh, a lot of the science of sleep and the different stages of sleep and things like that. Now, I promise it's not going to get too boring, but if you do, I'm, I'm trying to make it as interesting as possible. <laughs> sleep, so, but if you do happen to fall asleep, that's okay. I, we're here to support sleep, so I'm not you know, guilty for calling sleep when you talk about sleep. It's okay. In whatever form you can get your sleep, you do your thing. <laughs> okay, so the, the two terms I, I want you to try to remember are REM, R-E-M, and non-REM, which is uh, abbreviated N-R-E-M. So these are the, the two basic ways of categorizing sleep stages. Now, technically, non-REM is, is broken up into stage one, two, three, and four, but for simplicity, we're going to talk about REM and non-REM. REM is the part of your sleep when you are dreaming. Um, it's right called REM because it's, it stands for rapid eye movement. When you dream, you're going through all this crazy stuff in your head. You're basically having the most insane hallucinations anyone's ever had. And your eyes are darting around um, non-stop while you're sleeping. So they call it REM sleep. The other part um, is non-REM sleep. It's where you're not dreaming. Um, you have stages one and two of non-REM which are the lighter stages of sleep, and then three and four, which are the more medicinal ones, these are the deeper stages of sleep. But 
all stages of sleep are important. They're like food groups. You can't just have protein all day long or just have fat all day long. You need everything. You know, you need your fiber. You need a modest amount of carbs. You need a good amount of healthy fats. You need good protein, amino acid building blocks for your cells, just like you need all these stages of sleep. So to go a little bit back into the history of sleep, um, you know, so many people these days are, are looking at sleep as the enemy, something to be conquered, as if like, if you do enough stuff, or you push hard enough, or your willpower is strong enough, you can get by without sleeping as much. Uh, and this is a losing battle, really not worth fighting. Literally every animal on the planet sleeps. Every single one. So there's, there's no, you're not gonna be the one member of the one species that managed to get away without sleep. You're not, it's not gonna work out, no matter how hard you try, right? Now, there's a lot of differences in, in how much animals sleep, the stages of sleep that they experience, how they sleep. Um, if you look, for example, at, say, uh, bats, they're sleeping 19 hours a day. On the other hand, you have elephants, four hours a day. Huge differentiation. And there's differences in the amount of REM and non-REM that we sleep see in, in different animals. For example, some of the more primordial animal, animals, like uh, reptiles and insects and fish, they don't do REM sleep. It's all non-REM, so they're not dreaming, really interestingly. So that crocodile, he doesn't dream. He just goes deep, and that's it. Does this, you know, very simple. Um, on the other hand, uh, well, actually, also, aquatic mammals, they're not doing REM sleep either, like dolphins, no REM sleep. And you might ask why. Well, during REM sleep, your brain paralyzes your body so you can't act out your dreams. And this is important in a number of ways. So you, you're, you can't move. And anybody who's ever experienced sleep paralysis knows that, right? Has anyone ever experienced sleep paralysis here? It's where, where you wake up and you, you can't, it's horrible, right? You can't move, your eyes are awake, you can kind of semi-control your blinking and breathing. It's a kind of a, a, a an error that has happened in your nervous system where <laughs> you're, you're awake, but your brain is not unparalyzed the rest of your body. It can be freaky. Nobody's ever died from ever gotten stuck in it. I know that's what everybody is like you know, when you're in it, right? Because I've experienced it as well quite a few times. That's what you think, like, what if I'm stuck here? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a fun place to be. And there's hallucinations that come with it sometimes, and a lot of fear. But anyways, so uh, dolphins are not going to go into REM sleep because they need to keep moving and be able to keep moving their bodies to come up and breathe periodically. So they never go into REM sleep. They also do this other weird thing where they only uh, often sleep with half of their brain at once, um, while the other half stays semi-awake. Now, you guys may be thinking, oh yeah, I, I do that, like when I'm in that business meeting after lunch, <laughs> and they're just like droning on. I kind of do that, I sleep with half my brain, and the other half is just kind of semi there. No, it's, it's not true. You can't, humans can't do that. As, as much as you might think, you can pull it off. That's another thing, like you just can't get away with it. Um, and then, uh, so, so that's dolphins, and then you look at, for example, the other great apes, you know, something similar to us, and wonder, okay, what are they doing? Interestingly, they do have REM sleep, but not nearly as much as we do. It's a huge differentiator between us and all the other great apes, is that they get way less REM sleep than we do. They need more sleep in terms of total number of hours, they're looking at more like 10 to 15 hours, um, but they get way less REM sleep. Why is this? Evolutionarily, they're up in the trees. They go into the trees because it's a safe place to avoid all the predators on the ground, right? You're not gonna have to worry about tigers and, and you know things like this when you're safely up in the trees. However, there's other dangers that come with being in the trees is that if you're asleep in a tree and you fall from you know 40 feet up, you're out of the gene pool. You're not passing through your genetics <laughs> until you move it in there again, that's it. So it's dangerous to be up in a tree and in a state of paralysis, which to where if you kind of, there was, a, you know, a bit of wind and the tree swayed and you were kind of tipping out of the tree, you couldn't very quickly readjust or grab onto something or something like that. So all the great apes that tried having lots of dream sleep, they died, basically, and were not able to pass on their genetics. However, things changed when Homo erectus evolved and essentially descended out of the trees onto land and this was kind of a chicken and egg situation around the time that Homo erectus also was said to be the first to have use of fire. And fire was now the new way to protect the Homo erectus from the threats that previously drove us up in the trees, right? So now we could sleep on the ground a lot safer, right? Nobody fell off the ground ever, unless you're sleeping on the edge of a cliff, which is just not smart, and that's, you know, uh, you're taking yourself out of the gene pool because for other reasons, right? But, 
So now we're sleeping on the ground. Now we could experience much more REM sleep. And that later led to the evolution of Homo sapiens. Now, why is this significant in the story of evolution to become this spectacular species that we are now in comparison to you know, beautiful and wonderful but somewhat simpler great apes? Is that REM sleep builds cognitive intelligence, creative problem solving, and emotional intelligence. These are cultivated and built up during REM sleep. So the less you have of this, the less you have of those. So this, it, there's many factors, right, that, that led to the evolution of humans being so interesting, you know. But this, I, I, there's, a, there's a big hypothesis out there, and I think it's very legitimate, that this played a huge role in that. So that is, is, is just amazing, uh, that sleep, basically lying there doing nothing, is actually amazingly evolving you as a person. There's like so much good stuff that happens in while you're sleeping, and we're going to get into that in a second. But now that we know where the sleep comes from, what's creating sleep in the body? Um, and I promise, I know you guys all want like the tips and tricks, we will get there. Um, but at first I want to, it's kind of like, you know, when somebody gets kidnapped and they, they kind of want to humanize themselves to the kidnapper. Um, I want to humanize sleep to you guys. Like you, you have sleep and you control, you can get that sleep, but I want you to know where it came from. Like no, it has a name, it has friends. Like what, what, what is sleep like? Um, so sleep, uh, comes from two main sources. There's two main driving forces, not just one. It's kind of like nature realized, okay, if I just cause sleep from one, if I do only one thing and cause sleep, these guys are smart. They'll figure out a way to, to, to get around it and trick it. But if I do two, they won't be able to beat both of them. So the two factors that are causing you to need sleep or to, to help you fall asleep are one, you have uh, this substance that builds up in your brain uh, that it's building up, building up, building up, and it's causing at the end of the day what's called sleep pressure. Um, and this is not necessarily like a, a pressure like a headache, but this is a pressure to where uh, you just get tired, right? The, 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 the weight of sleep is growing and growing upon you. And that's, that's one thing. So as the day goes on, sleep pressure builds, sleep pressure, sleep pressure, sleep pressure builds. Um, and then the other part uh, that you may be more familiar with is the circadian rhythm, right? So this is where you have this part of your brain called a suprachiasmatic nucleus, like really badass name. Um, and this is responsible for secreting melatonin at the right times. So it responds most effectively to two factors, light and temperature. And so we'll get into these a little, a little bit later and how you can use those to your advantage on how to sleep effectively at the right times. But so that is controlled by uh, sleep Sorry, sleep, as far as the suprachiasmatic nucleus and melatonin, is controlled by the temperature and the light that you're being exposed to. So you have these two factors, so the sleep pressure building and then the, the circadian rhythm. So it's interesting when you look at what happens when you're taking coffee um, or when you're having caffeine in the system because it is blocking the receptors that the compounds that create the sleep pressure would sit in. So they are being produced all day long. And then when it the, the coffee is taking up those seats, it's like a game of musical chairs, right? The, the compounds that produce the sleep pressure in your brain have nowhere to sit. So they're just kind of like building up and like standing around. And caffeine has a five to seven hour half-life. So, you know, if you drink two cups of coffee, five to seven hours later, you still have the amount of caffeine in your system as if you had just drunk one cup of coffee. So you don't want to drink uh, coffee or caffeine, have any kind of caffeine too late in the day because it's going to block these receptors to create the sleep pressure. Now, when eventually you get that caffeine out of there, you have a ton of these other compounds that are going to create the sleep pressure that just jump on you. That's why, you know, eventually when the caffeine wears off, you're crashing. And if you do an all-nighter, well, you, then you're really going to be feeling it. But interestingly, the next morning, it's not going to be so bad because then on, in terms of the circadian rhythm, that's waking you up again. So at least you got 50% of this equation supporting you the morning after an all-nighter, right? So you're like halfway there. But then if you wait till the next afternoon, evening, you are gonna be dying because <laughs> now you have triple the sleep pressure, right? And you've got, no, the, the circadian rhythm is not supporting you anymore because melatonin is now being secreted. So then that's when you're in real, real trouble, right? So <laughs> to get a little bit more about the differences between non-REM and REM sleep. Again, REM is when you are dreaming. dreaming. There you go, right? And then the other one, non-REM is when you're going deeper. So different benefits. This is, I want you to understand why you need them both so important. So with 
REM sleep, as I mentioned, it's for emotional intelligence, cognitive intelligence, creative problem solving, uh, and it's basically where your brain is able to take in the new information that you've got during the day and integrate it with the existing information that's already there. It's kind of like uh, doing a software update. It's, it's taking all this new stuff and seeing, okay, how am I going to take all these new rules, bits of information, things I've observed, integrate them with what I already know to now be functional knowledge. It's like taking information and turning it into like functional knowledge and wisdom. Um, they had actually shown that when your people are learning new languages, especially new grammatical rules, that you can teach it to them and they'll intellectually get it, but they're much better at functionally using it after experiencing REM sleep. So it's, this is an amazing processing time. It happens the same with kids. When they're first learning language, you can kind of teach them some new things, but they won't really be able to use it effectively until after they've had a good amount of REM sleep. And then they've even you know, shown this in mice and, and learning new information and sending them around mazes and things like that. So this is something that exists across species. Um, and then we go to the non-REM sleep. This is a little bit different. This is when you have this uh, aspect of your body. It's actually a, basically an organ system that was only recently discovered. It's called the glymphatic system. Now you may know the lymphatic system, but this is with a G. And it's, it's referring to the glial cell. This is the glymphatic system. And when you're asleep, in this, these deeper non-REM sleep stages, it is flushing out the brain, rinsing out the brain with cerebrospinal fluid and washing out all the metabolic toxins, washing out all these compounds that are creating this sleep pressure and leaving you with a clean, fresh, ready to go brain the next day. Um, deep sleep is also where you're um, de-stressing uh, and it's where you're, you're getting, in, in a lot of ways, the most restorative. It's where you are secreting the most growth hormone, which has that is cascade effect of um, other hormones as well, because it affects the levels of DHEA that you're going to have. Then, you know, that also is going to affect estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And you hear so much about, you know, so many macho guys love to say, oh, I don't need sleep. I do like four or five hours. I'm good. Well, something interesting that those guys should know, uh, our, our president being one of them, is that <laughs> when you sleep, when you, if you're chronically undersleeping like that four or five hours, your testosterone levels as a guy are going to be the same as a, a healthier person 10 years older than you. So you are drastically accelerating andropause, which is like the, the male version of menopause where your testosterone is just going way down. It's not good news for guys at all. Um, and of course, for women, there's also other, other hormone imbalances that will stem from this. Um, and deep sleep, uh, it's so you get the hormone effect and hormones just control so many aspects of your health, right? And this all becomes really interesting because you don't experience these sleep stages in the same amount through all parts of the night. If you look at the way the sleep cycles work, in the start of the night, you spend a lot more time in the deep non-REM sleep. In the second half of the night, you're spending a lot more time in the REM sleep and a lot less time in the deep sleep. So if you are somebody who only sleeps five, six hours, you are depriving yourself of what you're going to get in that latter part of the night where you're getting that REM sleep. Now let's look at some people who are chronically doing this, uh, especially as teenagers because of early school start times. Mm -hmm. You know, getting up at 5, 6, and even like 6.30 in the morning. And it's a problem because teenagers have something that changes with their circadian rhythm during the teen years where their body wants to stay up a couple hours later. And this is evolutionarily, so they start to gain a little bit of independence from the family. Uh, and start to kind of have that independence that builds up slowly instead of like, okay, we hit it with you all at once when you're 18. They have these couple hours of, of, the, of the night time that are kind of their own time. Um, and they want to sleep later, obviously. And the whole thing is it slides a little bit later. Um, and what happens is if we're getting them up right and early to go to school, we are cutting off their supply of REM sleep. Again, REM is cognitive and cognitive development, emotional intelligence development, taking in new information and integrating it. This is like what they need most. And they've actually shown in studies where they took schools, looked at what their you know, standardized test results were, shifted start time back to 9 o'clock, and then looked at the standardized test results afterwards. Huge improvement in learning and performance. So it's amazing. And the other sleep group that is, is very misunderstood is the elderly. We often hear people saying, Oh, old people, they don't need as much sleep anymore. Now, that's not actually true. They actually need it more than anybody, probably. Because, especially these like deep stages of sleep, this is when you're washing out 
beta amyloid plaque out of the brain, which is you know a huge factor in Alzheimer's. It's the, you know this is the most restorative. It's the best for your immune system. Um, and the problem is, elderly people develop a problem with sleep generation. They have a hard time um, with the biological processes that create sleep. That doesn't mean they don't need it, right? Like if if, if you know I looked at somebody who didn't have much money and he said, oh, he, he doesn't need money just because he doesn't have it, right? That's not a very good, logical, well thought out conclusion. Maybe he just has a hard time, you know, finding a job or, you know, hard time you know, sticking to a work schedule. Doesn't mean he's not hungry, right? <laughs> or the guy said, you know, the guy starting out, they're like, oh, he doesn't need food. He's, he's transcended that. No, that's not how it works, right? Just because you can't do something doesn't mean you don't, it's not a good idea to, you know, to be able to. Um, so, those are, are two sleep groups that are very misunderstood, but of course, at all levels, if you're not getting between seven and nine hours sleep and, and, and good quality sleep, there is going to be significant and, and, and measurable declines in your performance in so many areas. Mental, physical, immune function, learning abilities, um, emotions, like, you know, after you've not slept enough, how are you going to be handling a you know potentially confrontational or challenging emotional situation compared to when you're well rested? We're in so many ways not the best versions of ourselves if we've not slept enough, right? So your immune function is going to go down long term. That brings up cancer. It's a big deal, right? Because when you look at cancer, you're basically looking at okay, how can the body control these cancer cells and make sure to you know get them out of there real quick as they're going to start to pop up? It's when the immune system is not able to keep cancer cells at bay that it goes wild and you get into all kinds of real serious problems. Um, also with Alzheimer's, um, all these degenerative diseases uh, are at a much higher level of risk if you are not sleeping enough. So it's, and, and you, you gotta get these different sleep stages as we mentioned. Um, and also, you know, when you're not sleeping, you're not, as I said, emotion processing, you're not taking information as well, you're not learning. And it goes beyond, really, what is just about you. Of course, sleep is going to make you a better version of you, but there's another, like, kind of, I don't mean to get a little, like, darker, but there's a darker side to sleep deprivation and drowsiness that is really important to keep in mind. And this is drowsy driving. Huge, huge problem. Um, and and the, the crazy thing is, when you are sleep deprived and drowsy, you're sleep deprived, you cannot judge accurately how sleep deprived you are and, and how much your performance has declined. And you, you lose that ability, so it almost like doubles up on how bad it is. It's like you're drunk, but you don't know how, you, you're so drunk, you can't tell how drunk you are. And so much so that if you have, and, and they've studied this by you know, doing reaction time tests and also putting people in driving simulators, if you have either been up 19 hours, so that would be like, okay, I got up at seven o'clock for work, and it's Friday night, now I'm gonna stay out late and go with friends, but I'm not gonna drink, I'm gonna do the designated driver, I'm safe, right? But I'm coming back at you know two or three in the morning. So if, you, if you've been up 19 hours or more, or you've only slept four hours a night before, your reaction time and driving abilities are equivalent to that of somebody who's at the legal limit of being drunk. And there are, every 30 seconds, there is an accident, driving accident, caused in America by somebody who's drowsy drives you driving an accident every 30 seconds and causes more accidents than alcohol and drugs combined. Which is just stunning. And it's, they, they even tend to be worse accidents, and here's why. When you're drowsy driving, you're either, and something goes wrong, right, and it goes too far, you're either falling asleep or you're doing what's called a micro sleep, which is where you fall, you kind of semi fall asleep just for a couple seconds, like your eyelids semi close, but you lose really awareness of what's going on. And so you're not having the delayed reaction of a drunk person. You're having no reaction. You're just plowing through whatever, and it's it's bad. So this is something where it's not just you stand a benefit from you getting a good night's sleep, but everybody. And I would almost you know go as far as to say if you're getting in an Uber or a Lyft. Ask that driver, say, how many hours have you slept in the last 24 hours? Because you know, these guys are hard workers, I respect what they do, they're trying to provide for their families, but so many of them work insane hours, you know, trying to make a living, honest living, but it's dangerous. Like you wouldn't get in a taxi with a guy who has a legal limit of alcohol toxicity, right? And so this is like the same thing. So 
What are we going to do about this? How are we going to make sure that you get this epic night's sleep, well rested, and get all these sleep cycles just right, and so you can enjoy all the performance benefits, all the cognitive benefits of all this. So, is it sleeping pills? What do you guys think? Vanessa, Ambien, is that going to get us there? No, and I just want to tell you a little bit about why, because it, this is something that so many people, it's, it's massive in America, the amount of people who are taking sleeping pills every single night. The way that they work is they are simply sedating. They are um, just going directly to the cortex of the brain and acting as a pure sedative. They don't put you into a natural sleep. You're not going to get the natural sleep cycles. Not only that, they're not working as good as most people think. And it's funny because first, they only slightly outperform placebo in sleep latency, which is the amount of time it takes you to fall asleep. Um, they, you do get better sleep latency over taking nothing at all, but a placebo gets you almost just as good of a benefit in terms of sleep latency and falling asleep as fast. And then, during the night, people report via you know, their, their subjective report afterwards that they slept well. However, when they actually put these people in sleep labs and hook electrodes up to their brains, it's not the case at all. Totally different. They, have much, uh, they don't get the right sleep cycles. They are, uh, have many more awakenings at night. And you know, there's also all these side effects of like doing things you don't remember, being drowsy the next day, not having good information recall the next day. But the problem is the fact that they, they don't remember that they had a good that sorry that they had poor sleep the night before because they were basically unconscious, not sleeping well, but unconscious, right? So it doesn't actually get you these these uh, sleep cycles, and you're especially not getting just deep sleep. And and deep sleep, I also want to explain there. Um, something that happens during deep sleep that's real important is this transfer of information from short-term to long-term memory, from the hippocampus to the cortex. And this is so important, uh, and also what's happening there is um, pruning of information that you took in during the day. Your brain, it's amazing, can actually, it goes through and makes decisions on, on, okay, what's important that we're going to transfer to long-term, and what can we throw out? And they've studied this by telling people, okay, here, giving them you know, a list of facts, and then saying, okay, here's the ones that are really important, and they're more, much more likely to remember those than the other ones. So you're pruning information, deciding, okay, what am I going to throw out, and what am I going to put into storage? Because obviously we take in so much information every day. If you try to transfer it all into long-term storage, it would be very difficult. It would kind of be going crazy. Um, so you're not getting that information transfer, which is, is bad news. Um, and you know, it's, it's good now that so much more knowledge and awareness is spreading around this, and now doctors are much uh, more inclined to recommend the new recommendation, which is called CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, um, which is actually outperforming many of these sleep drugs, which is great uh, that people are, are seeking out this alternative and it's, it's available to them. And they basically, they put you through a lot of the sleep practices that we're gonna talk about in a moment and sleep strategies, um, along with some other cognitive behavioral stuff. Um, but it's so cool that for insomnia patients, this is now out there. Now, another thing, and, you know, getting a little bit more away from the artificial and more natural, another thing people like to rely on a lot is wine and cannabis. You guys think, are these going to do the trick when it comes to really good sleep? I, don't, I know I don't want to have to take these away from you. <laughs> I, I feel like a jerk taking these away from you because you know they love them. But Together or separate? Either way. Uh, yeah, yeah, separate. separate. They, they, they basically, interestingly, they, they do kind of work in, in uh, the same way, in a certain sense. Um, so what happens here is that they are impairing your REM sleep. You're not getting this dream sleep, again, where we're doing emotional processing, dealing with traumas, cognitive processing, creative problem solving. They are stopping you from getting enough of that. Similarly to, um, to like the, the sleep sleeping pills, they're... Um, allowing you to fall asleep faster, so improving sleep latency, that's what it's called. And you, you think, people subjectively think they're getting a better night's sleep, but they're not realizing that what happens when you actually put somebody in a sleep lab and look at them, you have less restful sleep and more awakenings during the night, and, and you're actually not getting as restful of a sleep. So those are not optimal. Um, now, interesting question is, what about CBD? That's you know everywhere these days, right? It's blowing up. Um, Interestingly, so, so it's still kind of early days on the research of CBD and sleep. So we, uh, oh, sorry, or you're not familiar with CBD. Oh, CBD is called cannabidiol. Um, it's a non-psychoactive um, hemp 
cannabis derived substance that's a, um, a neuroprotective, it's a very good anti inflammatory, and helps with sleep actually, looking at you know the early stage research. Um, and it doesn't appear to interfere with REM sleep and have that sedative effect in the way that THC does, which is great. So there's actually a tool there. Um, so that's something. And let's talk about what other tools and strategies we can implement here. So really, when it comes down to it, the ideal sleep is something that you want to start planning for at the beginning of the day. So you get up at the beginning of the day, and within the first two hours, you want to get as much light as possible. Ideally, the ultimate is if you can get like 20 to 30 minutes of bright sunlight. That sets your circadian rhythm. It tells your suprachiasmatic nucleus, okay, this is daytime. Don't be producing LDM and melatonin now. You gotta wait. Because as I remember, we were talking about the suprachiasmatic nucleus, it's what controls your melatonin production, very sensitive to the light. So you wanna get this great light in, in the beginning of the day. And then in the morning, if you can do 20 or 30 minutes of like, um, Light to moderate aerobic exercise that will set you up really nicely. Gets you know, gets your blood moving, gets your heart going, tells your body, okay, this is the daytime time to be alive, time to be awake. We're trying to really set the circadian rhythm really solidly. And then as you go you know, later in the day, you want to make sure that if you're having caffeine by two o'clock, absolute latest, you're cutting it off. Because remember, we said caffeine has a half life of five to seven hours, and it's going to block what are called your adenosine receptors. Adenosine is that substance that is creating the sleep pressure because it builds up in your brain. So you have this adenosine building up all day long, but you're blocking those receptors for the adenosine as you're having caffeine. But as soon as that caffeine's out of there, adenosine pours in. But if you've had so much caffeine late in the day, it hasn't cleared out yet. So, there, so there's nowhere for the adenosine to come in and give you that sleep pressure. Now sleep pressure sucks if you're feeling it in the middle of the day, but you want this adenosine-based sleep pressure in the evening because that's what's going to put you to sleep. It's, it's so much easier to fall asleep when you're actually tired compared to when, you know, when you're totally awake, right? So we don't want this in the day. That's why we do so many of these things that we're going to talk about, like you know, the exercising and getting the sunlight. But then you want this at night. So by the nighttime, you want to have caffeine long gone so that those adenosine receptors are opened up and the adenosine can get right in there and put you to sleep. Um, now. Also in the afternoon, sometime between 12 and 5 is a great window to do your more intense exercise. So you do light aerobic stuff in the morning, and then afternoon is great for intense. So whether it's high intensity interval training, strength training, weightlifting, um, things like that, great to do in the afternoon. And then you want to make sure you're not eating dinner too late. Early dinner is good because you don't want to go to bed on a full stomach. You know, there's a risk of indigestion happening, and it's going to diminish the restfulness of your overall sleep if your body's having to devote a lot of energy to digesting. Um, and you know, it, it's interesting because if you have slept well, this is another reason to really want to get good sleep. If you sleep well, your metabolism becomes so much more regulated because we have these two hormones called leptin and ghrelin. And these are, they sound like little hobbit names, but um, <laughs> leptin and ghrelin. And leptin is the hormone that makes you feel full. Ghrelin is the hormone that makes you feel hungry. They're kind of on the two sides there. I got the dark and the light side, right? Um, so leptin, when you have had a good amount of sleep, your leptin levels are great. You're not too hungry. When you've had a bad amount of sleep, your leptin levels crash and your ghrelin levels go up. So you are super hungry and you haven't slept enough. And you're gonna consume three to 400 more calories on average if you've slept less than six hours. And because your judgment also becomes worse when you haven't slept enough, you are, and they've shown this in studies, they put out different food options for people who are sleep deprived and see what they actually go for compared to people who've had eight hours of sleep. You have worse food. You make worse food decisions. You're more inclined to eat much sugarier, junkier food if you're sleep deprived. And so that, that is a huge part of the weight control issue with sleep loss and, and sleep deprivation, as well as also looking towards diabetes. You know. When you are sleep deprived, you're not able to as effectively clear out the glucose out of your blood. Um, your, your insulin is not working as well. So when you're sleep deprived, you're right on the path towards um, developing prediabetes and diabetes. So it's sleep, as you can see, like there is not a single area of your health that better sleep will not improve. It does everything. It's like better than the best multivitamin you'll never encounter. So we want to have this dinner not too late, right? And, of course, you want to minimize stress during the day, 
right? The less stressed you are, the easier it's going to be to fall asleep. <laughs> come for a float, come for an infrared sauna, do these things, you know, do meditation, and, and just create a life that's less stressful. But I know when you're stressed, the worst thing is hearing somebody say to you, you need a stress <laughs> less, right? Is there anything that makes you more stressed than being stressed when somebody tells you, stop being so stressed, right? So I, I don't focus so much on telling people to stress less, but I like to give you tools on how to manage the stress in terms of lifestyle practices, exercising, getting good sleep, um, uh, supplements, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, and, and these all, you know, it's kind of like when, they, when you're doing things wrong, they make other things go bad. Uh, like if you're stressed, if you're not gonna sleep as well, then you're gonna be more stressed because you didn't sleep as well. And it's just this horrible cycle. If you can jump in there with a couple tools, you kind of start pushing things in the other direction and really turn that tide, and then you can develop, develop more of like a beneficial snowballing cycle of things. So you wanna have that dinner, not too late. And then later, if you need to, you can have like a small snack, but keep it minimal. Um, one thing that's actually been shown in studies to be beneficial is having two kiwis at night um, within like an hour of going to bed. It's random, but it works. Uh, uh, and that helps that you can help you actually maintain balanced blood glucose while you're sleeping. Kiwi's nice because they're, they're minimally sugary, um, but they, you know, they have a good, a good amount of water in them, good phytonutrients and fiber and things like that. Um, and then now let's look at what you're gonna do in terms of light in the evening. Remember we talked about light being so important as something that's affecting the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is controlling melatonin production, right? Bright lights are not something that we evolve experiencing in the nighttime, right? Think back to our evolutionary cave dwelling pasts, and you've got great bright sunlight during the day, that's why we wanna make sure we get that in the morning hours, right, to signal to your body. This is daytime. Then, at nighttime, you are not under bright blue lights and street lights and staring into computer screens. This is not something we evolved to deal with. So, this is really throwing you off. If you are on an iPad, they've shown this in the study, for, uh, for an hour before going to sleep, reading on an iPad, your melatonin production will be pushed back three to four hours. So when you are, are exposed to bright blue light at night, it suppresses your melatonin production because you're telling your body what? It's still daytime, right? The sun's still shining. You better not produce that melatonin because I'm gonna fall asleep right here in, in the middle of the day. Um, so that's, it, it's really problematic. Now, there are solutions. You can get blue blocking glasses, right? They're fantastic. You can get them in orange or even the real hardcore way to do it is go for the red ones at night that block out all the blue light. Really fantastic and will help you tremendously with your circadian rhythm. And they also have now software for the computers, like you have Flux, um, or the Macs have Night Shift on them, which is already built in, where you, it's scheduled and your computer will start changing to more of an orange tone at night, right? Now that's good, but it's not blocking all the blue light. Like if you're you know, on your computer, there's still blue light coming out. So um, on Flux, it, there's a, a setting where you can go into called uh, go into dark room mode, and it will turn the whole thing into nothing but red and black. It's very weird looking, it takes a little getting used to, but that's a great way to still do whatever business and emailing and article reading you need to, like, need to do at night and not be disrupting your circadian rhythm. Or on your phone, if you're, I don't know how this works on um, like uh, Android, but on Apple, um, there is a way, now naturally they have the, the night shift mode now, which is good, but there is a way you can go into the settings and if you go onto um, our addictive wellness, youtube.com slash addictive wellness YouTube channel, uh, we have a video tutorial there on how to do this, so you can check this out later. Um, there is a way that you can set it up so that with just three taps of the home mm -hmm. button, you can turn the phone to all red, so it's safe to look at at night, which is huge, because technology is here to stay. I, I, I don't think I'm gonna have much success if I have to tell you guys stay off your devices for the last three hours before bed. Like, okay, but who's really gonna do it, right? So I'm all about the functional tools to sort these things out, and that's a great way to do it. Now why is red light okay at night? Evolutionarily, think back. What, what kind of light do we involve having at night? Fire. Fire, there you go. So that red orange spectrum, that's acceptable. That doesn't throw us off. And interestingly, when you're, if, you, if you are looking at red light, doesn't interrupt your night vision. It doesn't dilate your pupils in the same way. So you could have, like if you need to have like a night light in your house or something, because normally those are really bad for circadian rhythms. If you can do it, get a, a red bulb in there, that's great because you can still you know, find your way to the bathroom and not kill yourself because dying is bad for longevity. Um, but you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be disrupting your sleep cycles, which is great. Um, and this is also another reason why you want your bedroom to be completely dark, not have any light coming in, have a sleep mask if you need to, but if you can get like 
blackout curtains. It's really fantastic. Uh, and then temperature is also a big factor, right? So the other thing that affects your super guys and I can this is temperature. Your core temperature needs to drop three to four degrees for you to really get to sleep. This is amazing and it's so natural because what changes do we experience naturally in, you know, in the wild environment? Hot temperatures during the day, cold temperatures at night. It's the natural cycle of things. So that's you know when you're getting outside and exercising in the morning, getting out and doing a little bit of aerobic exercise in the sun, you're raising your core body temperature. It's daytime. Nighttime, you want to cool off. So you want to ideally have a, a cooler sleep environment, right? And so the ideal temperature they found in studies is between 63 to 65 degrees. Um, and so you can imagine how the super chiasmatic nucleus gets very confused when you're in a, a climate controlled house that's 72 degrees all the time, 365 days a year. It's like, what's up, what's down, what's day and what's night? I can't like figure out what's going on. And add, combine that with the blue light at night, it's like, you are really confused and your poor body it doesn't know what to think, right? So uh, temperature control is really good. Um, now you might think, well, then why does it make so much sense that I take a hot bath before going to bed and I fall asleep so easily? Or I take a sauna and afterwards it's so easy to go to sleep. Like, it's actually good to do those things. And here's why. If you're doing a hot shower, hot bath, or going in for a sauna before going to bed, uh, it's fantastic because all the blood when you're warm comes to the surface of your skin, right? You get this vasodilation, you get all this circulation opening up. Then you go back out of this warm environment, your blood is still at the surface cools because it's much more exposed to air at the surface rather than you know in your core around your organs and cools your body faster so anybody who's ever coming out of a shower hot shower knows this it's a whole lot colder than the air was when you went in it seems like <laughs> right you're like it went you always think how it was not this cold when i got in the shower out here now it's it's freezing right because you've like exposed your body to take in the cold and so you can kind of ride that wave and allow it to cool you and fall asleep much more quickly and hit those lower body temperatures. And you don't want to be like shivering, shaking cold at night, but you don't want to overheat. Like here in California, we know this, it's much easier to sleep in the winter when it's cold than in the summer when it's like 95 degrees at 11 o'clock at night and you're just dying, like no blankets and just like sweating right, you know, all over the place and just like miserable, right? It's much harder to sleep under those circumstances than on a cold winter night. You have no problems doing that, right? So that's temperature and light. You really want to make sure you're controlling. Now let's get into supplements. Um, and of course, you know, before I go there, relaxation during the day. Floating is a great way to do it. Meditation in the evening is great. Even meditating kind of like while you're going into sleep or doing a yoga nidra or something like we were doing here. Um, develop kind of a bedtime routine that involves getting rid of the blue light, that involves cooling down the temperature, maybe opening the windows, letting some colder air in. Get kind of this routine going that you ease into every night, and, and that gets your body used to it. Okay, this is what we do, this is the signs of sleep that's coming, we're gonna start winding down. Um, now going into supplements, one of my favorites is magnesium. Multiple ways you can take it, it's so great, it's good, it relaxes the body, it relaxes the mind, it calms the muscles, um, it, provide, it helps your uh, mitochondria, the power plants of your cells produce more ATP. What's ATP? This is your cells' pure energy. Why is that important for sleeping? I mean, energy is sleep, right? Well, actually, we talked to you earlier about the glymphatic system. It's what flushes your brain out at night. It's what comes in and does all the deep cleaning in your brain. That requires your mitochondria and this ATP to run. So the more ATP you have, the more efficiently you can wash out your brain, the more refreshed you're gonna be the next day. So magnesium helps with that, actually. Um, two of my favorite forms are magnesium glycinate. Um, and this one is really nice because it uh, absorbs very effectively. It doesn't uh, cause a lot of the gastrointestinal disturbances um, that a lot of other magnesiums do, because you don't, last thing you want to do is be, you know, waking up in the middle of the night having to run over to the bathroom, and like, that is going to disrupt your poor circadian rhythm, I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, this one's really great. Um, and then my other favorite one is a new form called magnesium L3 in it. This is actually just developed. Um, by scientists a couple of years ago. It's magnesium bound to an amino acid called threonine. And the way that it works is it actually very effectively crosses your blood-brain barrier. Things, something that other magnesium supplements don't do uh, really at all. Um, so you're actually raising your brain levels of magnesium. So it's very relaxing to the brain, very good for the nervous system, actually shown to reverse aging. 
of the brain, which is spectacular. We can all use a bit of that, right? Um, and so magnesium L3 is the other one that's so good. Yeah, so magnesium you got, right? Um, and then L, as in lady, dash, T H R E O N A T E. And by the way, we're going to put a video of this on, on YouTube later with like full subtitles. Um, so if there's spelling of anything that now or, or later or whatever, um, you can always check the subtitles later. But of course, you can ask me now. It's really cool too of us. If you miss anything, it'll be there for you later. Um, so that's magnesium. Um, then also another one is L3 and E. This is an extract from green tea. Um, it's not the stimulating caffeine part of green tea, it's the calming part. That's the cool thing about green tea. It kind of like most this aware calmness, but you can just take the calming part, this L3 in you, um, which is very calming for the whole body, for the whole nervous system, really helps with sleep. And then I love herbs. This is like where my hugest passion at um, is traditional herbal systems of indigenous cultures, especially uh, Ayurvedic and, and traditional Taoist herbal systems. Um, so I'm going to get a little bit excited here. I'll try to like keep it under control. <laughs> so um, my absolute favorite is reishi mushroom. And this is actually the most well-studied herb in the world, shown to be very effective at improving sleep quality and quantity. You end up sleeping longer um, when you're taking reishi mushroom. Very calming. It's not a sedative. You can take it during the day and it will help with stress and anxiety. It just gives you an amazing feeling of inner peace. It also does a whole host of other things and in terms of the immune system and um, anti-inflammatory and lowering histamine, so many things. But our interest for now is how it's affecting sleep, and it's so calming. I remember the first time I ever had this. I was like 19, 20 years old. I was going into a yoga class, and I thought I was taking something else, and I grabbed, grabbed the wrong bottle, and it was a new bottle. And I, I, I realized what it was shortly after taking it, and it was like, as soon as the reishi hit my tongue, it was in a tincture bottle at the time, um, and as soon as it hit my tongue, I like this wave of calm came over my body, and almost like all my muscles went limp. And I kind of I was standing next to a wall, and I kind of like crashed over into the wall, like very gently. Wow! And just like my my mind went quiet, stopped thinking, and I could just like feel my heart blossom. It was incredible. And I walked into that yoga class. Wow! I felt really good. And I was a little early, and I rolled out my mat, when I stood at the front, and I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> This is nice. This is nice. This is real good. Uh, and it's amazing. Uh, and, and so it's very beneficial for sleep and for anxiety and for so many of the challenges that we know we deal with in the modern age. Also very liver supportive as well. Um, and then also some other Chinese herbs that are very nice. Um, pearl powder is another one. Um, very calming, very stabilizing. Um, and then there's a formulation called ginseng and zizipus. Z-I-Z-Y-P-H-U-S. And this is great for insomnia, really helps with insomnia, um, and, and having restful, peaceful sleep. So that's a really nice one to consider. Um, and then we can jump over into the Ayurveda world, uh, and some of my favorites there are ashwagandha, um, which is good for so many things, right? Supporting the thyroid, supporting overall hormone health, decreasing stress, um, just about any body function you have going on, ashwagandha is like, it's a good chance it's gonna help you out. Um, and it's so good for balancing stress and anxiety. But at the same time, it improves energy and endurance. So you can have it during the day, you can have it during the night. It's adaptogenic. It's one of the greatest adaptogens in the world. And it's so good for bringing your body into a calm, balanced, stress-free state for sleep. And the other one we love to pull from Ayurveda is holy basil. Um, this is a fantastic one for calm, for stress reduction, um, and, and it just really, really chills you out. And you can kind of experiment with these different ones. And, you know, I, I always say no herb is perfect for everyone. So if you try one herb and it doesn't work for you, you don't need to keep like forcing it and pushing it and trying to make it work. Try some other ones. There's, there's lots of great options out, out there. You know, give the herb a fair chance, you know. Give it, you know, two weeks, four weeks, something like that to, to start feeling something. Because um, the way these herbs work, they're kind of like an, an immediate feeling and benefit. And then there's like the long-term cumulative building uh, effect as it starts to really um, affect some changes in your body. So just kind of quick summary, when you want to create the epic night's sleep, always be thinking about the two different things that are going to make you sleep. You have sleep pressure, which is where you want the adenosine to build up through the day and eventually make you go to sleep at night. You don't want the caffeine blocking that adenosine. And then you want to have your circadian rhythm. You just directly want to make that melatonin at night and not at any other time. And you want to make sure you make it at night 
and then you're not just turning the naked at you know one in the morning when you've been rolling around for three hours, saying like what's going on. Um, then you want to get that exercise early, get more intense exercise later. Make sure you're in the sun early in the day, early dinner, don't eat too late, and then get some of these great supplements and herbs in your body that are going to really help with the stress, help with the anxiety, and you know incorporate other strategic techniques like infrared sauna or hot bath or hot shower to um, relax you at night and then allow your body to cool off and ride that temperature lowering wave into a great night's sleep. And I think this is just such a wonderful thing you can do for yourself and all those around you because the benefits of sleep, as I said, it benefits everything. There is no area of your health that is not going to benefit from getting better sleep, whether um, it's your brain health, your cognitive health, your memory, your ability to creative problem solve, that's something that you really get from the REM sleep, from the dream sleep, is the creative problem solving. Your emotional intelligence, your ability to prevent long-term disease and you know, maintain a new health, all of this. Sleep is the greatest biohack, the greatest performance enhancing substance you're ever gonna come across. So I wish you guys a wonderful night's sleep. Thank you so much. Thomas. Yeah, we have a few minutes uh, yeah. for Q and A, yeah. and then we'll transition into our yoga ninja practice. Awesome. But yeah, we have and some then, time for anybody who, if, if we get cut short on Q and A, we do on our Instagram page, which is Addictive Wellness. We do it almost every day. Uh, I do about twenty-five minutes of Q and A stories on there in our Instagram stories, so you can always come over, check us out over there later. If you know questions come up tomorrow, like something pops into your head, like what was that thing you mentioned, or what did you mean by this, or what about this here? Send us your question out uh, through the through the Instagram stories uh, question box, and, and it will you know continue the fun endlessly on there. Yes. <laughs> so go ahead. Um, I know you talked about the teenagers and the elderly people that have sleep issues. What about parents of small children? Yeah. Or like chronic sleep deprivation, right. or toddlers who wake up in the middle of the night. Um, yep. That's my issue. Um, I hear you. And. Even if my child is going back to sleep, I'm still up for three hours afterwards. <laughs> right. So, so a, a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, you want to make sure that the sleep you do get is of optimal quality, right? So, you want to implement all these we call them sleep hygiene practices in terms of the eating and the light and the temperature, so that you're not just stuck in like a light sleep all the time. You're actually getting these deeper sleep cycles and more restorative, you know, um, physically restorative and emotionally and mentally restorative. Cycles. Um, of course, your sleep is not going to end up being perfect. Um, if if you are, are you turning on lights at night when you're getting up? To I do care? all this. I've been doing this for so long. Okay. I do all this good swaps. Oh, you're doing it all. I got spidey night vision. I don't do. Oh, that's lights. right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was, was going to say you could have a you know a red light to turn mm -hmm. on at night. No, um, I just walk. The you dog. know where you're going. Yeah. 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 Okay. Wonderful. Um, you know. Uh, for kids, it can be great to, to do things like taking a magnesium bath mm -hmm. or using topical magnesium like they have here to improve their relaxation and, and their sleep. Um, that, that, that can be helpful as well. You know, if they're sleeping better, you're going to be, you know, sleeping better. Both of us go to sleep well, it's just like waking up at whatever time. Right, right. Well, the, the magnesium, it, it tends to relax you more throughout the entire night. So, it, look, every situation is a little bit different, but it may give a better chance of just staying asleep and sleeping through this. Um, and yeah, it's it's tricky. I wish I had a perfect solution. Um, the you know the only thing I've got really is maximize the sleep you are getting, um, and and try to experiment with different things in terms of maybe herbs you take or you take magnesium in the night and things like this that don't keep you up for that window of time or, or maybe some. You know, yoga nidra or meditation practices or, or binaural beats or things like this that, you can that will speed up that time of you falling back to sleep because, as you said, that's, it's rough to be caught back awake and um, not going to sleep. Yeah. Thank okay. you. So, my question is it's very similar except going back to sleep with mm -hmm. no kids, but <laughs> love to wake up in the middle of the night right. for some reason. So, magnesium and meditation are Mag your two recommendations for going time. back to sleep. Yeah, um, reishi is also, or reishi mushroom is a really nice one too. Um, and that's something avoid, you could take in like the middle of the night. Like, you could, you could have like, you know, uh, you could one by your bedside table. Pre, pre mix it in your, you know, in a little drink by your bedside table. 
Um, you could have a tincture bottle, you know, various ways to go about it. Um, if, if you can like hold it in your mouth for 30 to 60 seconds and get that um, absorption through the mucosa membrane, uh, so it gets you right in your system, it's gonna have the most immediate effect that way rather than like swallowing capsules. Um, it's gonna take a while, which is not what you want in your case, right? So um, that's really nice as well. Uh, and then I think if you can, yeah, you know, avoid temptation to look at your phone um, and, and, you know, start checking texts and emails and Instagram and all these things, because I know it's, it's tempting and they'll like, like do something at least, right, instead of just lie there awake. Um, and if, though, if you are not sleeping and you're just lying in bed for a long time, it's actually shown to be beneficial. This is interesting. It's almost counterintuitive, but to get out of bed and go do other calm activities, like read or just you know, whatever you can find to do that's not gonna hype you up too much until you feel tired again and then go to sleep. Um, because they found that if you keep your bed psychologically as a place for only sleeping and not being awake, it's gonna kind of, it, it breaks it off in your brain. It's like, okay, when I'm here, I sleep. If I'm awake, I go somewhere else. So you're more likely to be able to continue to sleep that way. Go ahead, um, having at times, I guess, in my back and forth schedule, I try to get a nap in when I can. Yeah. Which I sound like a child of myself, but. No, 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 um, naps are very positive. Yeah. What would be, I guess, an optimal nap? Yeah. Of, okay, okay, absolutely, absolutely. So, a couple things. Um, don't feel bad about taking naps. Naps are great. It's actually the more natural way to sleep um, when we look at ancestral cultures. cultures um, and the way also that our, our blood sugar and, and awareness fluctuates during the day, it is perfectly normal to have a siesta. And, and because your you're aware, awareness for people always, no matter what you're doing, no matter food-wise, it's not just, you know, I ate too few of a lunch or too many carbs. Even when you're fasting, energy levels dip um, in that early afternoon time window. So it's actually probably a more natural sleep cycle to do six to seven hours at night and maybe half an hour to an hour afternoon. If you have a lifestyle and job and stuff that make that work, it's fantastic. Um, how to maximize it? Um, get, get somewhere dark. You know, you want to basically mimic that it's nighttime. Um, get somewhere dark, uh, somewhere quiet. Don't feel bad about it. Um, and then you want to make sure you don't do it after 3 p.m. though, um, because then it's going to be harder for you to fall asleep at night because you, you may have cleared out too much of the adenosine out of your system, so you won't have enough sleep pressure at night to get you to sleep then. So that's something to be aware of. If you've left it too long in the day, it's better to push through. Um, but if you can get it at like one or two, it's great. Um, so how does it affect sleep when you wake up at the middle of the night to go to the bathroom? Like, let's say you have like a glass of water and then it's like 3 a.m. and you're like... Right, so that's something where in the hours leading up to going to bed, you really want to stop drinking water. Um, you want to make sure you've hydrated well throughout the day so you don't have to drink before going to bed because, of course, it's going to be a major interruption to your sleep if you have to wake up and go to the bathroom. It's not the end of the world. Um, it's you know, better than lying there and being miserable, but um, it's, it's suboptimal. So if you can look at um, when you're drinking your water in the evening and push that back earlier and earlier to where you really kind of gotten it out of your system, you have to go to the bathroom before going to bed. Um, that's going to be a lot better. Uh, make sure you're not taking any diuretic supplements in the evening um, that could cause you to be having to go to the bathroom because um, that is also going to be problematic. Uh, and then light-wise, if you have like a nightlight, as I said, make sure it's a red one or just don't have any lights at all. Hopefully you can find a way. You may have heard this because I can a little late, but did you, did you talk about it? I know some people say they don't think I'm running, but what the optimal amount of deep and REM sleep is it's about, uh, so uh, ultimately, ultimately uh, the ideal would be about 25% of your total sleep for each of those. Okay. And then the rest. So uh, so RAM 25%, deep, non-RAM 25%, and then you get about 50%, which is uh, light REM. So you have, with REM, you have, uh, sorry, with non-REM, you have um, state one, two, three, and four. One and two are lighter, three and four are deeper. Um, so about half your sleep is going to be stages one and two, um, and then about twenty five percent. Okay, so you're getting about twenty five percent of both of those. Degrees. Right, right. Okay. So that's that's something really good to aim for. Um, also, something um, good to look at is you want to look at um, your your restfulness and sleep efficiency is what they call it. Where how much time of the time you spend in bed, how much time you spend awake versus asleep, 
and you ideally want to get above 90%. Okay. So you had mentioned working out early in the morning and then somewhere between 12 and 5, and so do you discourage those who like to work out at more than 8? It's suboptimal. Yeah, probably better than you know, probably better for you. If it's a question of working out at 8 or not working out at all ever, working out at 8 is better because there's always the other benefits to working out apart from just you know sleep-related things. Um, but it is uh, going to rev up a lot of aspects of your biology a little bit too much um, for the winding down process. You should be really starting around that. Yeah, because I've seen that where some nights I'll work out and I'm like done, like completely just crashing and yeah. other nights like last night I was like <laughs> fired up around, yeah like, yeah so what, what happens in the studies is that doing intense exercise is great for your sleep but not if you do it too late then it actually decreases your quality of sleep is there somebody over in the jail? You're all good. Yeah. Oh, oh, perfect. Awesome. See, we deal with a lot of the same issues. Yeah. Great. Oh, um, oh, over here. Oh, over with you in one second. Sorry, I hadn't looked over there. My apologies. So, you're next. Go ahead. So, you mentioned sleep paralysis. Yeah. So, what can someone do to not experience sleep paralysis? I, okay, you asked the right person because I've dealt with so much of it. I, first, I remember I first had it when I was 16 and just like, crap out of me. And then I kind of got used to it. Um, but, okay, so, so a couple things. Um, keeping a steady sleep schedule, super important. If you're sleeping at random hours, and this is good for overall sleep health, is if you can maintain a regular time as much as possible when you go to sleep and when you wake up, fantastic for, for developing good sleep um, cycles, um, especially for sleep paralysis. Um, other things, uh, don't get too exhausted. That's when it's much more likely to happen if you're exhausted. Um, and then if you, I don't know if you sleep with a partner, um, one thing that I found with my girlfriends has been like an absolute godsend is that I can control my breathing, but not, I can't talk, but it's true, I can't, I can't talk, but I can control my breathing and kind of blinking, right, when you're in it, and I start just breathing really loud, and she knows to shake me and wake me up, it's like an absolute miracle, not a deal um, so, so, so that's hugely helpful. Um, but then the other thing that really took it to almost not happening at all anymore for me um, was neurofeedback. Um, and this is where you go in, you get electrodes hooked up to your head, and you're, you're watching a screen, and it's measuring different brainwave patterns. Um, and through feedback that you're getting through the screen, it's able to encourage you to have certain beneficial brainwave patterns and discourage the, the dysfunctional brainwave patterns. Um, and that, for me, pretty much wiped out my sleep problems. I think we have time for one more, more. Okay. question. One more, then the rest will do uh, tomorrow morning on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, they're actually really great. I highly recommend um, Chuck Sage out on Addictive Wellness, and he's always answering these amazing questions, and it's just like this epic download of getting this really good information on a daily basis. Right. Okay, last one. Go so forward. sometimes uh, REM sleep can work against you in the sense that you go so far into it, nightmares and night terrors live there. Uh -huh. right? So what, do you have any tips for when that happens, my first instinct is to like wake up, turn off the lights, shake it off. Is that is that good? Is there something better I could be doing? Yeah, probably would uh, shake it off. Cool, absolutely shake it off. Get yourself out of that state. Um, and and I, I I'm, I'm lining up things I want to say because there's so many because I've dealt with this as well. Um, so don't turn on the lights. That's bad news. That's really going to throw off your melatonin activities and, and decrease quality of sleep going later into the night. Um, managing stress during the day uh, can be very impactful for this. Um, and, and you know, night terrors come from a variety of things, right? Um, it could, you know, in, in some cases, in most all cases, as an adult, it's likely that it's some PTSD related thing, um, whether or not you remember the trauma or not, what you know. Traumas are different for different people, and it could be some random thing that happened when you were a kid that you don't even remember that, but just like kind of locked into your subconscious and something doesn't go quite right. That's another one where I've found massive, massive benefit um, from neurofeedback. Hugely, hugely impactful. Like, and I, I tried lots of stuff, like all these herbs, all these supplements, all these sleep hygiene practices didn't touch um, really like violent dreams that I was having. Uh, neurofeedback. In five sessions, I was seeing lots of benefit. Ten sessions, they were pretty much gone, and I, you know, I did a few more sessions after that to make sure they stayed away. Um, but basically, it's 
uh, training your, your brain waves uh, to not go into this um, loop of, of like <laughs> the scary dark place um, where it just like spirals out of control. Um, and yeah, that for me, that you know, different people get benefit from different things, and, and maybe yours will respond to you know the, the, the relaxing effects of being in a float tank or an infrared sauna or taking reishi mushroom or different things. It's different not different for different people. I um, but <laughs> it's neurofeedback. It, it's look, look. It's a little bit of an investment to do it. You got to do at least ten sessions to, to to you know cover some ground and get somewhere with it. But it is beyond powerful. Yeah. I never knew that existed. Oh, fabulous! <laughs> Wonderful. Glad we got something new in there. Okay, great. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Yeah.